Babu she wore a deep blue dress for our first evening in Venice, with a light blue ruffled collar that extended low around her neck, graced by a thin chain of gold. Heather was dressed in yellow that matched the charm of Venice and its brightness. It also reflected her brightness as a human being that had a beauty all of its own. I was the exception. I simply wore a white shirt and black pants, the standard requirement for official business environments. Ross, on the other hand, looked like he just come from Jamaica. Tony came close. Steve was the most elegantly dressed of us men. His dark blue silk shirt matched to she's dress perfectly. Sylvia was dressed in white, simple in style, but elegant in appearance. Most of what we wore was purchased, courtesy of Uncle Sam. To buy these clothes seemed like robbing the bank, considering the economic crisis that was still brewing back home in the USA. Nevertheless, our expenditures represented but an infinitesimal fraction of what was spent each single day on defenses that might become unnecessary if we were to succeed in our mission and in what we felt it could accomplish in addition to it. After ordering dinner at our first night there, Heather unpacked the glass sculptures that she and I had bought earlier to celebrate our being in Venice together. We had bought them in a tiny art store that was crammed to the ceiling with anything from die-cast junk to marvelous artworks of the finest glass. We were told that Venice had become famous for glass art, produced by world-renowned masters and their apprentices, who were masters themselves of this delicate art. Heather had noticed one of the sculptures in the window. According to the card in front of it, it was made by a Venetian master whose name I couldn't pronounce. It was nearly hidden by a porcelain bowl. Actually the store had three more sculptures of this type, similar ones, all made of perfectly clear optical glass shaped into smooth abstract forms. However, the real attraction wasn't primarily in the form itself. It was in the way in which the form worked to fracture the light. That's what fascinated me about them. To me, they represented our self-love becoming manifest in our love for each other in countless different ways. The more light we put into our self-love for our humanity, the more fascinating became the sparkle of this light by reflection and refraction. In this sense our trying to choose between the four sculptures that had been set before Heather and I became one of the loveliest experiences of our enchantment in Venice. The experience of choosing between the sculptures was unfolding slowly and gradually. I was drawn inwards by the beauty of what we faced, which evidently reflected something of the artist's beautiful soul. The shop owner had taken us to a room in the back of the store, where he had a box set up, draped in black velvet. He put the four sculptures on them. Several spotlights shone on them from above. A hundred thousand lire each, or two hundred and fifty thousand lire, for all of them together, he said. First we must choose, said Heather. If it had been up to me the choice would have been easily made. There was something magical about every one of them. Actually, it was up to me, and I was inclined to buy them all. One of them reminded me of our day at the Sandcastle, the last day, that Heather and I had shared. Looking at the sculpture, looking at Heather, I felt the same feeling again. God knows why. Maybe it was the way it sparkled. With the sculpture standing between us, we were facing one another with the same glowing sense of excitement that had stayed fast in my memory. It was a deep reaching, gentle feeling, a mixture of peace, joy, and childlike anticipation of good things to come, mixed with a daring to reach for it all in one single grasping. In the store, the first night came to mind that Heather and I had shared. It happened on the very day we met, shortly after dinner in Elizabeth City. With Tony glued to his ball game broadcast, it seemed both logical and exciting to pay Heather a visit. Oh how unprepared I was for what became an emotional explosion that made no sense that day, yet seemed totally natural. Maybe she wanted to hear me say, wow, once more, as I had greeted her earlier that evening. When she stepped out of the elevator. And I had meant it then, too. This time the word, wow, had been too small to do justice to the power of the moment. The door is open, she said when I knocked. I thought you might be coming, she added. Oh, wow. 
There she was as naked as she was born, standing like a Greek goddess, near the balcony door, with the sparkling lights of the motel's neon sign dominating the scene behind her. This was heaven. As if someone spoke, the words of a hymn came to mind. O oh Jesus, our exemplar, by works, now understood, reveal their full effulgence in love's sweet brotherhood. Oh yes, love's sweet brotherhood was unfolding indeed. I knelt before Heather in this magical moment, spontaneously, and kissed her vulva, that had become the center of the vista, surrounded, as it were, with light. She seemed not to have expected my response. Neither had I imagined such a thing to be possible. Still, she allowed it to happen. Within moments, she even encouraged it further, as if to increase the reflection and refraction. While remembering that night, standing with her in the small art store in Venice, I remembered a painting of the same type of scene that had become so amazing that night. I had seen this painting in a gallery in Washington. It presented nearly the identical scene. Only the background was radically different in the painting. In the painting a great room dominated the background, in which a festive social event was in progress. Most of the foreground of the painting was taken up by a richly embellished noblewoman. She was painted with her lower garments parted in front of her, and a well-dressed gentleman kneeling at her feet, kissing her vulva with apparently great satisfaction. What the painter had painted might have been a timeless scene that would likely have also been understood in distant ages long before the time in which the painting was done, just as it probably reflected what in modern time every one of the countless men would desire who routinely crowd around the stages of the strip bars in so many pubs around the world, which their smiles allude to. On our night in Elizabeth City, long after the grand kiss ended that had been not a small event indeed, as in the painting. When we came back to Earth, I dare to ask the question that had puzzled me all the way through our happening. As to what Miracle had brought it all about. Her answer came with a smile that solicited another, wow. She pointed to the table along the wall. Among their usual stuff, I noticed a Bible open. When I saw the Bible in the drawer, she said, I remembered a friend telling me not long ago that I should read 1 John when I am lonely. To my surprise I saw many passages underlined with a highlighter pen, in the book of 1 John. She showed the underlined passages to me. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God, in him. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us hereby know we that we dwell in him, and he in us, because he hath given us of his spirit. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and every one that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. When I read this, she said with the same smile, as before, I could only think of you. All that I could think of was you. I prayed that you would by some miracle come into my room. And then I noticed this further passage on another page. And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. Aren't we brothers then, in the family of man? She added. I wanted you to come so badly that I got fully undressed for the occasion. I guess one needs to acknowledge the process that one believes to be true. And there you were. I didn't even have to wait long. It all happened on its own, as if mind is reflected in mind, love in love, truth in truth. Mind is reflected in mind, I said quietly. God is incorporeal, but is reflected in man, and the universe. The intelligence of the universe is incorporeal. The divine is incorporated in us, and the universe. We are its shape, beauty, sublimity, its spirit manifest in its myriad forms of expression. Sex is an element of the divine, and an amazing one at that. It is an aspect of the all-encompassing dynamics of mind, and soul, and life, and love. It manifests truth, and principle, and spirit. It has its roots in all of these. It is a corporeal expression of the infinite one. That's what my friend Steve says it is. But what does it mean? This, we have yet to discover, she said with a grin. The night that we spent together in Elizabeth City became an aspect of the universal kiss that didn't fade in the dark, but retained its sparkle and stayed alive for many days. 
in this sparkle, the distance that is deemed to be civility became reduced to zero, while the natural zero distance between heart to heart was laid bare before us that night. We had touched the zero distance love that the poets sing about in terms of the kind of love where all love's colors melt into a symphony of color. That's how the glass sculptures came to light in my thought in the art store in Venice. Our days after Elizabeth City had sparkled in the same way as the glass sculptures now did, to some degree, which they could only hint at, since nothing would ever match those momentous showers of sparks from those days, in the past, which had been flowing so freely in their innocent brightness from within. Sex hadn't done this, then. It had merely opened the door. What came out from behind the door had made the simplest things appear special, like drinking ginger ale with her or picking wild flowers. In part, our excitement of being together in those days came from not knowing what fascinating wonders would pop into view next. This was the kind of promise that I now felt again in Venice. All of this was brought to light in those sculptures. And for a moment, time really did stand still. Being in love with Heather was a force that had made me more sensitive to the loveliness of our world. Also, this love had not ended, nor was it likely now that it ever would. She was, as if she were a catalyst for life's sunshine. Seeing her together with the glass sculptures added still more magic to the sunshine of the moment. There was a blending there of something that belonged together, which was also linked to myself, linked to my own self-love, and beyond that, to Ushi, Steve, Sylvia, Ross, and Tony. Heather's flowing dark hair contrasted with the light. It blended with her radiant smile, which in turn added to the sparkle in her eyes. It seemed as if Heather's bright and sparkling nature was brought into focus by the magic of the clear crystal glass. The magic was evidently reflecting the artist's mind, who had created its shape, and unfolded in a special way, as it transposed the fractured light into the larger frame, in which we all existed, as one undivided whole, made up of stars and rays of light, in which we find our individuality. Evidently the artist understood the dynamics of a human being and had created a perfect mirror for it. The other sculptures had a similar effect on me, but in a different manner. They reflected the beautiful soul of Sylvia, the brightness of Ushi's smile, Steve's unfathomable depth of understanding. Ross' boundless knowledge of things, and Tony's enthusiasm, and his infinite patience with my lack of omnipotence. It appeared to me that this glass art was designed to have this effect. It also enabled one to look into one's soul, to explore one's self-love as a human being. It appeared as if the sculptures captured the qualities of respect, honor, intelligence, alertness, ingenuity, care, affection, and so forth, which we had recognized to be essential elements of our humanity. That's what we had learned to cherish as a resource for enriching one another. It seemed that this glass art presented a testimonial to the great principle of universal love that we had now committed ourselves to build our lives on and our hopes around. Had the artist recognized this principle too? Obviously the artist had recognized it before we had. There was a great deal of power in this deep reaching feeling that this glass work inspired. I hope that this feeling of something rich and its power that I saw unfolding when we looked at this sculpture would resurface in some way in Sylvia's eyes when she unpacked the artistic work. As I handed her the gift-wrapped parcel at the restaurant I remembered the difficulty I had in deciding which one I should choose for her. 250,000 lire, for all of them, the store owner had repeated to affirm the price as he stopped by while we were still deciding. In the far reaches of my mind it occurred to me that it was customary in this country to barter. 300,000 lire. I replied. Mamma 300,000 it is, he said in broken English, and left us alone for another ten minutes. While we admired our purchase, another place and another time came to mind that accented these lovely moments with a bitter taste. But the bitter taste didn't spoil anything. It made the precious moments more precious to hold on to. The incident had happened a long time ago, so it seemed. I had come to Java on a technical mission and taken a few days off afterwards to explore the countryside. 
The local travel agent had rented me his personal Land Rover that was large enough to sleep in quite comfortably. I had camped beside a meadow one night, just outside of a mountain village. In the morning I found myself surrounded with a profusion of flowers, a sea of delicate colors and shapes. The air was sweet with their odor. The whole scene sparkled with freshness in the bright light of the early morning sunshine. I got the camera loaded. The scene before me was a photographic delight. Some of the flowers had just opened their petals to the morning sun and to the ever-present insects that came to feed in this richly delicate world of color and fragrance. To judge by the depth of my feelings for Heather, Boosie, and Sylvia, and in a different way for Tony and Steve, that profusion of loveliness in Java seemed closely related to our present world with our being together. The feeling of delight was also reflected in the sparkle of the sculptures in the way they fractured light. The sparkle brought those days in Java back to mind. In my excitement of photographing the flowers I hadn't noticed a temple servant coming towards me from the direction of a small temple built at the edge of the village. He came to pick flowers. He came with greedy eyes. He took bundles of them in a basket. His god obviously demanded many flowers, a rich offering of living things for a dark, dead image of stone. He wasn't careful in picking them. He tore them out, almost viciously, at least that's how it appeared. I nearly intervened. Maybe I had become too sensitive, if this is at all possible. I stepped towards him, but then decided to leave him be. After all, this was his home, not mine. As I remembered the episode in the store, while we were looking at the sculptures, I also remember Dushi's brightly sparkling eyes when she was telling me in Kozumral about her wanting to have a baby. There was the same sparkle in the sculpture as had been in her eyes. I could only guess what wonders this little life would have drawn into focus against the brutal poverty of our world, in which life had become so cheap, and all things delicate, preciously fragile. I hadn't intervened in Java. It would have been rude. But should I act the same in this larger arena, in response to this final impending sacrifice that mankind was allowing, and supporting to be set up against itself, called nuclear war? This larger world is my home, I thought. The impending sacrifice that is demanded is too immense in scope to be left to the private whims of some misguided utopian ideologues, or to the servant of some insane tyrants, that lay claim to the world. There is too much beauty in living too much to be loved. Nothing in the world can justify sacrificing any of that to the rituals of the game of nuclear bombing. I shuddered, wondering how much of humanity had already been sacrificed, yanked off like those flowers, and cast into dark places hidden from the sun in order to satisfy the insatiable greed and misused power of money of a tiny clique. I cried for mankind, inwardly. I cried for the millions of women who by a force beyond their grasp were impelled to live out their life beneath the burqa, never to be touched by the world's sunshine, never to be loved by another man, never to have her face seen in public, or to leave her imprint on the world with the power of her smile and kiss. I cried for their men too, who owned them, who likewise lived in isolation from the love of their universe, by the force of their circumcision, and who in their poverty demand the burqa to keep their wives secure. And I cried for the Western men and women, who were more deeply imprisoned by the money of their greed, enslaved by the millstones of their properties, who were choked by allies, made shallow by opinions, and emptied by the rage of politics and religions. I cried, because too few people in the world were free to be human and free to love. When the shop owner came back I gave him 400,000, and embraced Heather, and told her that she should choose one of them as my wedding gift for her and for Ross. I had the feeling that she understood what this implied. Or did she really understand? We were both in tears after our embrace. During our embrace the sculptures were being packed into ready-made boxes lined with soft synthetic foam. We left the store arm in arm, our faces wet with tears, my mind half in a daze, drunken with emotions. The music that we had heard in the store was still with me as we walked away and what music it had been. It had been music for the soul, a solo violin rendition of a melody that sounded like a meditation. 
I couldn't decide whether the music had added to the wonders of the artwork, or whether the artwork had added a new dimension to the music, or whether perhaps our love had given a new meaning to both. Whenever our hearts met, a deep love emerged that was carried by a thirst for the beauty of life, that was gradually becoming a fire again that could never be satisfied, a flow of love from heart to heart, that promised to be always fresh and new, that had once been blocked by an impasse, that appeared greater than either of us, but which had finally been resolved, so it seemed. Just to have the privilege to experience this flow of love again, even if it is only now, and then to feel the bright sparkle of its moments, was coming to light as a greater treasure, than any king might have possessed. And with it came this promise in her smile, that this, light, would continue no matter what the circumstances would be that might arise. I felt no urge to ask for more. Indeed, who could ask for more warmth, than a fire, that is burning, and for more light than the sunshine from our human soul? In the end it was Heather's smile, as we walked away from the store. That interrupted my thoughts. What made her so beautiful was not her body wrapped in her fanciful yellow clothes. A person, who loves deeply, from the deepest recesses of the heart, is always beautiful. That's what Steve had once said as far, as I remembered. That was most certainly true for her. These thoughts brought to mind the words of the elderly Japanese man again that I met on the plane crossing the Atlantic. He had talked about a unity that I had but faintly understood. I was now slowly beginning to comprehend what he had really been saying about humanity being a spiritual species on a journey in a material universe, living by its spiritual principles. He had talked about our humanity as being totally spiritual, as being a light in the world that unfolds with joy and love, manifesting warmth, affection, generosity, sex, vitality, the spiritual gems of our being, which ennoble the world in which we live. What has your life been like after our footsteps parted in the sands of the sand castle? I asked on the way back. Supernova events are rare in the universe, said Heather. What happened in Elizabeth City, and thereafter was comparable to one of their rare occurrences. In the universe those events don't continue for long. I am grateful that we had those days together. I came away richer than I thought possible. So, I'm not sad that they ended. However, I learned last night that one does need to experience supernova events now, and then. What happened in Elizabeth City happened to me only once more, and it happened last night in Innsbruck, when Steve invited me for a stroll after dinner, and then to his room for a nightcap. Everything happened in almost the identical manner. Only this time it was Steve who found a connection for it in the Bible. He recited parts of the 23rd Psalm, but with the corporeal sense of God replaced with the incorporeal, spiritual sense, in which the all-harmonizing principle of the universe comes to light as love. What he said was beautiful, Peter, Heather continued. It gave the occasion a beautiful meaning. But more than this, I needed to hear this simplified statement of a profound truth that I had never really recognized before. He bowed to me as he recited the verses in the way a poem might be recited. And as he did so, he slowly kneeled down before me. Love is my shepherd, I shall not want. Love makes me to lay down in green pastures. Love leads me beside the still waters. Love restores my soul, my spiritual sense. Love guides me in the paths of righteousness for its own name's sake. Though I walk through the valley of great challenges, I will fear no evil. Love is with me. Love's rod and love's staff comfort me. Love is preparing a table before me in the face of all the world. Love is anointing my head with oil and makes my cup running over. And so I'll dwell in the house. In the consciousness of love. For all the days of my life. In the presence of goodness and mercy forever. This made the long kiss that followed more beautiful, Peter. And I really needed this kiss, said Heather. Afterwards Steve invited me out for a drink. I think Steve did all this to raise me up. He said that God is incorporeal, which he said, means that we are the divine corporeality, in all aspects. Reflecting only what is good, beautiful, powerful, and true. In short, all that God is and its infinite spirit, that is inherently divine. I think Steve could somehow sense, she continued, that Ross is a circumcised man, 
and that the resulting relationship with him is like a desert in some respects. So that I needed an uplift to a higher level of thinking. I didn't realize it was that obvious. But he also recognized that Ross is a beautiful man, intelligent, kind, and that I love him dearly even if he lives in his own little sphere of exaggerated self-importance and a strong sense of entitlement. Steve sensed that in Ross' presence I tend to feel rather small. I told Steve that Ross wants to marry me, but that I can't go this route on the current basis and never will be able to until we can stand side by side. Steve told me that we should be able to make this happen and how this might be done. Let me guess, he based his proposal on the atomic model, I interjected. He likes to make those comparisons. But I can't imagine a principle existing in the universe that incorporates the circumcision. Steve does, said Heather, smiling. Steve explained that an atom is the construct of a complex complementary relationship between a proton that forms the nucleus and an electron that is drawn to it by mutual attraction. But, as Steve pointed out, they never absorb each other. When they come extremely close in their attraction, when they kiss each other so to speak, a still greater force than their attraction repels them apart. Thereby, the electron that carries the least mass bounces back, but instantly becomes attracted again. By this interplay the atomic structure is formed that is a million times larger than the electron itself that forms it. Steve said that the entire gigantic atomic structure, as minuscule as it is, is maintained by the dynamics of the kiss by which the universe exists. He compared it to a sexual event. His take is that a person needs the same dynamics expressed in the form of the equivalent intimate sexual kiss. His take is that this dynamic equivalent is needed on a frequent and regular basis for a well-functioning and closely knit social structure to be possible and to be maintained. And here comes what you find puzzling. As you know yourself, Peter, most of the atoms in our world are not of that simple type, but have more than one proton at their nucleus, and have an equivalently larger number of electrons associated with them. Steve says that since in the physical sphere, like polarities repel each other, the universe invented the neutron that had its polarity neutralized, which acts like a type of glue that keeps the nucleus together. Steve suggests that a circumcised man who also tends to be more homosexual, might fulfill the role of the neutron in a larger bond arrangement. Steve said that the universe would likely not exist without this principle being widely implemented on the atomic scale. He suggests that we would do well to find a way to implement this principle for creating larger bonds also in the structure of our civilization. This means that we are facing an amazing challenge to make this work, I interjected. It won't be easy to do this, even if thereby all of our respective needs can be met. My hunch was right then that your living with Ross has been somewhat empty, sexually speaking. Society's sexual needs are rarely ever fulfilled in our love-starved world, Peter, and less so in my living with Ross, but I won't walk away from Ross for that. He is an amazing man in all other respects. Steve thinks highly of him. He thinks, however, that Ross would probably be happier in a larger type of bond. For this, of course, there exists no precedent yet in the social domain, even though the universe itself wouldn't exist without its larger bonds. Steve suggests that for this reason a pioneering effort is once again called for. He suggests that the result could be amazingly exciting and richly fulfilling for all concerned if such a pioneering venture can be made to work. But would Ross be interested? I said. This is something that has to grow out of the heart and soul of all of us, said Heather. I am more concerned, therefore, about you and Sylvia and Tony. How would any of you become affected in building this kind of wider and more natural platform? Steve warns that it is always scary if a whole new world opens up before one. I don't know how to answer this, I said quietly. We know far too little about the potential new world yet. Yes, but we are also fast learners, said Heather. Now, this was something that I could agree with. Ross unpacked the glass sculpture that Heather had chosen. 
He unpacked it right at the restaurant before dinner, where our celebration of life in Venice was continuing. With the sculptures on our table, a new sparkle was added to the sparkle of the lanterns that grace the nearby ships in the lagoon. Ross showed the sculpture to Heather, then embraced her for a long time. There was a similar grand unpacking underway everywhere at our table. A sculpture for Ushi and Steve, one for Sylvia, and one for Tony. It had seemed simpler for me to buy all four of them. Heather glanced at me now, and then, as she admired her choice in its new setting, while I admired the special sparkle that I had noticed in her eyes again that I had cherished from the day on when we first met, which had not dimmed. It conveyed now a promise that nothing would ever stand between us again except the fire of love that takes away the darkness of distance. My thoughts for us being together had never been empty and my feelings never shallow, except now, they seemed to have become deeper still. They had roots that were nourished by an overflowing loveliness, a delight rooted in our soul and in its living. For me, the world was forever transformed by the riches of her touch and was transformed anew whenever our hearts met, or a new love entered the scene and enriched all loving universally. Each glance brought its own renewal of that love, and all love. That's what made her so precious, and others likewise, because of her, and me so rich for being touched by that uplifting love, though I knew that its essence was anchored in my own heart, that I found but reflected in her world. For a moment I wondered if this deeply drawn feeling of love was nothing more than an inward reflection of the romantic atmosphere of Venice that now by some magic had brought the sparkling moments of our love to the surface. Or maybe it was the gnawing thought that time was running out for us all, which had produced this effect, the feeling that everything that was beautifully human in the world might soon become lost. Maybe it was all but a reflection of our growing openness that allowed us to experience whatever had been blocked before. Well, whatever the reason might have been, the end result was that we enveloped one another in love with an intensity that made no sense in a conventional way and had no limits that I could see. Did you ever see a young man running? I asked Sylvia, did you see him jumping through the park, handing a flower to an old lady? That boy is in love. I looked at her sculpture, at her, at Usi, Steve, Tony, and Ross, the feeling I felt unfolding between us all included everyone in the same way. Why is this day so wonderful? I asked some time later. Is it this place? Is it our mission? Is it the freedom we have between us? Or is it the hope we all share and work for? Steve answered and smiled, we bring to each other the gift of love. Here the magic begins. People who love have a beautiful soul. That alone makes them beautiful. One's expression and one's spirit always matches the essence of the soul, that is our humanity. That is why we are surrounded by such beauty, because we embrace the essence of it as human beings. Steve paused and looked around the table, at each one present, and continued the explanation, turning to me it is the light of a beautiful soul that you find so exciting, and so you should, because it is beautiful. So, don't be surprised, Pete, by what you feel. What you feel is natural. Be careful, however, if what you feel appears to be too good to be true, because then you are rejecting its reality. What you feel can appear exceptional only in comparison to the background of the poverty that we have for so long endured. Love and beauty are not exceptional elements on the platform of reality that we have begun to explore. On the real platform life is beautiful. On this platform there is no other state possible. Poverty and greed, even hate, are not found on this platform. They do not exist there. Steve had made quite a speech in response to my question. Afterwards he proposed a dose to the truth that we had discovered about ourselves, about our love, and our world. Tony also made a speech. In his speech he reminded me of the crabs we had seen on the beach near the sandcastle, which knew nothing about nuclear war and the failures in human relationships. He reminded me that I had told him how infinitely richer I felt than those crabs. He reminded me that I had felt richer than the crabs in spite of the pain that all the world's horrendous problems have caused us, which the crabs knew nothing about. He reminded me that I felt richer than they did, 
for no other reason than for the privilege of being aware of this world, a world filled with people like Heather. Tony then extended this notion to include Sylvia, Bushy, Steve, and Dross. I nodded, saying, this is infinitely better than any old heaven could ever be. Oh, cut it, said Dross, that's an ancient one. But it presents a valid idea, Steve came to the rescue, smiling. We talked for some time after supper, way past the hour at which the sunset had faded. The air was still comfortably warm. Our day together had been beautiful right from the start. Or should I say, we were beautiful. We had smiled at each other, supported one another, loved one another, and this still continued. Bushy's faintly red-brown hair shimmered in the light of one of the many lanterns that lined the edge of the pier. Some strands of her hair were blowing into her face now, and then by the warm gentle breeze. In the background, the water was ablaze with color, a profusion of reflected beams of light from a multitude of strings of colored lamps that graced the marina across the bay. Sylvia's smile blended with this profusion of lights. It shone with a light of its own that was brighter by its own right and more brilliant to me than all the other lights put together that we could see, and more brilliant even than the stars in the firmament. I realized that what had happened to us all would have seemed unbelievable in the old world just a half a year earlier. Steve was right when he promised back in Leipzig, on the day we met that the unfolding of love would grow stronger, and never stop unfolding out of the depth of its infinite principle. I had my doubts then, but he was proven right already the very next week, when I met Heather. Without Steve's focus on freedom and love, I wouldn't have dared to stop for Heather, when she thumbed a right of me the loss, which this, tragedy, would have incurred, was hard to imagine now. What would our life have been like without the good things Heather had set into motion with her love? Those first days with her had been wonderful days, days in which we shared our life, and our excitement, with living all the way through the days of the naval hearing and the days of driving back to Pittsburgh. The resulting meeting of kindred hearts had sparked a celebration of love and life right from the start. It had become interrupted only at the end by an impasse, but the light of the celebration hadn't grown dim. Now, just a few months later, we were all together in one place for an even greater celebration of the wonders of love. What we had achieved was far greater than what Erica had hinted at as being possible, or even greater than what who she had allowed and Steve had thrust into the practical sphere. Steve had suggested when we first met that our dancing on the pinnacle of the world would change the world. It had changed us all indeed, from within, and now we stood at the threshold of changing the world from the depth of our dancing. On a mission of such magnitude that one almost couldn't dare hope that it might succeed. Tony Andros, it appeared, were dancing on this pinnacle in their own way, for their own reasons. Who could know what their stories entailed? Who could know what worlds upon worlds their loving had already embraced? We had created a world for ourselves that had never been created before on such a profound level, and yet this was the minimal platform on which we could possibly succeed. We were all aware that a single word spoken in the wrong tone could ruin everything at the conference. Our presence and our actions during the next day, unknown to the world, were destined to change the world for all times to come. Also there remained that lingering doubt that we might not succeed, though one way or the other the world would be changed by us. Perhaps it was by reason of this doubt that I felt that our world seemed suddenly more beautiful and precious than any heavenly paradise could possibly be as we looked at the riches we had within ourselves. Would we have the chance to see the beautiful things unfold and bear out their full promise? Our world seemed precious in the light of this promise and its wonders exceedingly fragile. I had a feeling that we have been cheating ourselves by having taken any of its profound wonders for granted. It seemed to me that we had barely begun to come to life. Should I ever die, I said to Ushi quietly, in order that Ross wouldn't hear me. Heavens forbid. Ushi interrupted before I could finish. I corrected myself, voicing the old saying again, and added that I would ask not to be shut up in some fancy old heaven, but would ask to have the privilege of coming back to the earth again. Oh, Pete. This one has been worn out years ago. 
Ross interrupted me, and grinned. No it hasn't, said Sylvia. It's just coming into view. It holds the key to understanding the principle that the needs of the one outweigh the needs of the many. The principle is true, because there is no outside possible in their universe, that is all, nor in their universe of our humanity, for the same reason. If there is no outside in this universe, then the one that is humanity includes the many that reflect it, which in turn is represented by each one. That's our heaven on earth, the infinity of one. It is real. It is concrete. It is tangible. It has the potential to be the brightest star in their universe, grander than any mythological heaven could be that would be as boring as hell. You'd better be careful, Ross intervened. Unless we succeed with our mission, our heaven might become a burned-out rock, before we know it, or an ice age paradise for penguins, with only few, rare human voices, to be heard, if any, and those would likely be sad voices of a mankind that has lost its song. Boo she cringed when she heard Ross talk that way. May it never come to that, said Ross. May the old saying, that earth is heaven, never die, nor the reason for the saying ever vain, I added. I sincerely hope so, said Steve, and raised his glass of wine for a toast. I remembered that Steve had never raised his glass, without a good reason. But this time no one cheered, as we drank in honor of our heaven on earth. I couldn't figure out for what reason no one cheered, except that I had this deep-seated uncomfortable feeling. That we carried the responsibility for this grand future ourselves, especially during the next few days, when our actions could tip the balance either way. If we failed, we could indeed set the stage for actions that might transform our treasured world into a desolate hell. And even if we were to win, the question would still remain whether it is really possible for mankind to rouse itself sufficiently to create the needed Ice Age Renaissance that would assure our food supply in an Ice Age world, creating a new world starting now. The possibility that we might fall short of reaching that goal, or of even getting started, had the potential to become frighteningly real. Still, our potential to prevent this failure was equally real. Isn't that what this is all about, why we are here? I replied to Steve when we talked about our part in it. We are not fighting a war. We are fighting to prevent it. We are fighting for an act of peace that will be maintained without end by its principle in which love can unfold and be our light. We are not just fighting against something so that war doesn't break out. We are fighting to create the brightest civilization ever imagined in which war has no place. That goal may seem to be still miles in the distance, but we also know that we must never let it out of our sight. We all knew that mankind wouldn't have a chance to recover itself physically from a nuclear war and still create the needed Ice Age Renaissance with indoor agriculture. If a nuclear war was to erupt, which no one could stop, and only a very few would survive, the long-term survival of mankind might be put in doubt. It appeared that the development of mankind is key to the development of successive energy technologies that require ever larger populations, and that the development of that larger civilization was built on energy technologies, for which the resources have already been used up in our progression. It appeared to me that it might not be possible to recreate from scratch the type of civilization that we have presently achieved with an infinite potential, should we allow it to be destroyed. Are you saying that we are fighting to uplift the human environment around the world not only to create the needed Ice Age Renaissance but also to protect the survival of mankind as a species? Said Ross. Are you saying that we can't be satisfied with anything less? I nodded. Mankind is clearly an infinite species. This means for us to develop space-based power and indoor agriculture, with or without the Ice Age coming up. Life expands. We cannot go back to stages outgrown. As we reach for the infinity of ourselves in the path of our boundless development we burn the bridges behind us there is no going back. The energy resources that we've built the present civilization on have largely been used up. If we blow up what we have created with these resources, and shut humanity down, the human presence ends. We cannot allow this to happen. This potential tragedy must determine every detail of every step 
that we take in the future, especially here in Venice, I said in total agreement with Ross. That's what it means to me, to evoke the future and to let the future determine the present. Steve just grinned and nodded. This means that we are here to fight for human life in the most global sense possible, said Usi. We are fighting for our world, our civilization, and our love, said Heather. Everything that we are doing here, as dull and as ugly as the details may appear to be in the heat of the battle, must be brought into context with that, Ross agreed. We must always remain conscious for every minute that we are fighting for the wonders of human life and for our privilege to love. If we lose sight of this dual context, we won't do the right thing. Then our efforts won't be dedicated enough and they will fail. If we are fighting for all the good and the beautiful in the world and in ourselves which includes our life and our love, then we are fighting for the things that have touched us in a beautiful way and have elevated us without this dimension, without the dimension of love, what is our life worth? What would be the substance of life if we lost the dimension of love? If that isn't something worth fighting for, Steve agreed, what is? We are fighting for our humanity more than for our personal life, I interrupted. We must understand this, because this is the truth. That's what it means to be human. A soldier in battle understands this to some degree. If we fail ourselves in understanding this, and to understand it absolutely in terms of what we must accomplish, then indeed, if we were to return to our treasured earth according to our wishes, said Sylvia, we would likely find it a burned out hell, and an ice world, without a trace of civilization. Ross interrupted Sylvia, and left. Let me tell you what we would find, he said. We would find a golden portal, the entrance to hell, and inside the vestibule of it a golden inscription, welcome everyone to the world of greed-based fascism, courtesy of Adam Smith. But this doesn't have to come to pass, replied Sylvia. We can defeat the ghost of Adam Smith before it destroys the whole world. All we have to do is establish and practice the principle of the universal kiss. Against the universal kiss, Adam Smith has no power to seduce anyone.